Hello, and welcome to the Switch for Good podcast. I'm Alexandra Paul, and I'm here with my co-host, Dotsie Bausch. Hi, Dotsie. Hey, hey. How are you today? I am awesome. I'm excited because you're actually going to give us some facts and figures about exactly <laughs> what we are going to be discussing on this show today with Dr. Joel Kahn. I'm trying to be a better partner to you because you like facts and figures. I do. So you're going to like this. Thank and you, you. She has no idea what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> I just did a little bit of research on my own, right? And, and, and as, we, as we do in preparation for our guests, specifically in this field of cardiology, because yes, we have a phenomenal, very well-known cardiologist on the show today that we're going to reveal in a second. Um, but just in, in, in learning about cardiovascular uh, disease and arteriosclerosis and, and what it is and what it's caused by... Um, I'm going to fill you in. Okay. And there's a little bit of a guessing game in the middle too, all right? So get ready. Um, so cardiovascular disease, as a lot of people know, and some don't, is the leading global cause of death. It accounts for more than 17.6 million deaths per year, a number that is expected to grow more than 23.5 million by 2030, mm. so just 10 years away. Now, arterial sclerosis is the most common cause of cardiovascular disease. It can be caused though by correctable problems. And that's not me inserting that. That is Dr. Google saying it can be caused by correctable problems such as an unhealthy diet, lack of exercise, being overrate, or smoking. And I love that because it puts us in the driver's seat, right? It gives us control. None of that says you need to take a pill. So our guest today is a cardiologist. It is Dr. Joel Kahn. I'll go ahead and do the spoiler alert. And he's going to certainly give us a lot of scientific facts and talk about research. And um, But I got to tell you that I like common sense facts too, right? Ooh. Things that I can wrap my brain around. So here's a little bit of, of research I did on my own. I wanted to figure out what countries have the most heart disease and what have the least, okay? So it's not what you think either. Oh. So we're going to start with, I want you to guess what country has the highest rate of heart disease in the world. Okay, I would think it would be Turkey or Finland. Oh, okay. <laughs> it is Russia. Oh, Russia. Oh, wow. Okay, so I was in the right area. You were in the right region. So I looked at that and I said, okay, what do Russians dine on? And this is what they typically eat. Salads covered in mayonnaise. So whether it's a potato salad or a lettuce salad or a bean sa salad, it is soaked and swimming in some kind of dairy, mostly mayonnaise. They eat various kinds of meats and processed meats. And the most popular dish in Russia is pelmini. That is a pastry dumpling filled with minced meat, slathered in butter, and topped with sour cream. Mm. Okay. What country has the lowest rate of heart disease? I would think it would be in a country in Africa uh, where they do not smoke a lot. So I'm just going to say um, Mauritius. Oh, wow. Who's, you're so creative today. To I don't know what to do with I you. I know the name of that country <laughs> exactly. in Africa. Close, but it's in Asia. Oh. It's Hong Kong. Oh, really? Yes. They smoke a lot in Asia, though. Doesn't that contribute to heart disease? I'm going to have to ask Dr. Kahn. Yes, Tron. yes. Yeah, that's why I picked Turkey. And then Finland for the for the fat and stuff. So Right. So Russia got Finland beat bad yeah. with the saturated fat. Um, but so right now, main staple dishes in Hong Kong are noodles, rice, <laughs> rice noodles, or congee, which is a porridge made from rice. Did I mention rice? <laughs> <laughs> right? A complex yeah, carbohydrate yeah. Um, and zero saturated fat. Uh, and a fun fact, I looked up uh, a Hong Kong Olympic swimmer. I wanted to know what some of the athletes were eating over there. Um, and this is Yvette Kong, who is actually going to be competing in the 2020 Olympics, competed in Rio. And her diet is a breakfast of a protein smoothie with bananas, blueberries, coconut water, and protein power, powder. Lunch is rice, imagine that, or pasta with pan fried or baked fish. She does do that. Dinner is a smaller portion of carbohydrates plus many cooked vegetables. Snacks after training include rice cakes with peanut butter, almond butter, protein bar in the afternoon, and veggies with hummus before bedtime. So this just common sense, right? It just tells me that the saturated fat in our food is what's clogging our arteries. 
Well, let's find out All right. today okay. because I know that it's a complicated issue. And, and we want to find out, too, people are so confused it's the new year, right? So confused. Paleo, keto, oh yeah, mediterranean, keto. vegan, let's, right? Yeah. So let's let's help people kind of unravel this. Okay. Well, let me um, let me introduce Dr. Yes. Khan. So we've had, of course, many doctors on this show, but Dr. Joel Khan is the first one that doubles as both a doctor and a restaurateur. He is also known as America's healthy heart doc, and Dr. Khan has been practicing cardiology for the past 25 years, and he's expanded his work to include healthy heart boot camps a holistic cardiac clinic, four best-selling books, and even his own podcast called The Healthy Doc VIP, which I recommend. In 2015, he opened the Green Space Cafe, which is a chic plant-based restaurant and cocktail bar. And so uh, as if you aren't busy enough, Dr. Khan, (laughs) you're now on (laughs) our show, and thank you for taking the time to be with us, and welcome. Okay. We have to get done because I have to scrub tables and do some dishes at the restaurant. (laughs) Okay, (laughs) you have our promise. We will get done. (laughs) Oh, if it were just a joke, it'd be nice. (laughs) So I want to start off with a question that actually is very, very basic. You, um, you're a cardiologist, so your main focus is preventing heart disease. I actually get confused about what is heart disease. Can you explain that? Yeah, and it's a great question, and it's not so clear to the public. So uh, there's a, like an umbrella term. We can call it heart disease, officially CVD, cardiovascular disease. All diseases of the heart, the blood vessels, very comprehensive. That would include stroke. And when we say that heart disease is the number one killer of men and women in the Western world, we're actually talking cardiovascular disease. It's the risk of heart attack. It's a risk of stroke. It's a risk of aneurysms and aneurysm rupturing. It's consequences of high blood pressure like kidney failure and stroke. So it's that very broad damage to blood vessels body-wide that can show up in different parts of the body, including shutting down kidneys and causing end-stage renal disease. The largest slice of the pie that you've talked about mainly when you talk about Hong Kong and others, uh, Finland, Russia, is we can call it coronary heart disease. There's no quiz here. You don't have to get this right. Atherosclerotic heart disease, clogging of arteries, taking beautiful, beautiful, I always have my little heart model with me, heart artery model, beautiful, beautiful arteries we're born with, turning them into completely clogged pipes, leading to chest pain, congestive heart failure, heart attacks, suddenly dying and dropping dead. That's the number one cause of that happening. And if it happens in a brain vessel stroke, if it happens in a leg vessel, risk of amputation. So uh, the, the, you know, there are certain heart conditions we don't have diet control over. If you're a child with congenital heart disease, that's a heart issue, but it's not going to respond necessarily to diet alone. Uh, and certain other conditions are genetic and inherited. But what we do have control over is the vast majority of diseases related to clogging of arteries. Call them heart attack, call them stroke, call them in men erectile dysfunction, call them leg circulation problems. And we have tremendous ability to recognize early in life if we're at risk for that and implement a program to dramatically decrease the chance we're going to suffer from them. So you, uh, for those who are just listening, you can go to our YouTube channel and watch and see what Dr. Khan just showed us, which was a tube that was full of this white stuff and just had a little hole that things that the blood could go through. What is that white stuff that's in that clogs? It's, it's butter and sour cream and cream cheese and marbled steak. Uh, I say that facetiously for those people that can't see because they won't know whether I'm telling the truth. That's probably how it got there. But it's, you know, it's um, atheroma. Atheroma is from a Latin word gruel. Kind of think of mushy, oatmeal-y, uh, buttery, kind of sticky stuff that accumulates inside the arteries. And the risk is one day because it's so unnatural and irritating to have your arteries full of this irritating material, um, you know, hard, the hardened plaque, is that one day a blood clot forms and that can form in half an hour. 
Uh, you can go out for a run. You can have a fettuccine Alfredo. You can yell at your husband, your wife, or your significant other. You can do a line of crystal meth. And in half an hour, a blood clot's on top of that gruel. You have no blood flow. You're having a heart attack or you're dropped dead or you're having a stroke. So heart disease can change from a silent, unknown problem to a instant killer in literally seconds to minutes. And some of the triggers I talked about smoking certainly should be one add to the, to the list. So in a healthy artery like the one that you showed in the beginning that was completely wide open, there it is, folks, um, if you have a blood clot, it can pass through because it has enough room. Um, there may be small blood clots. There can be. I mean, cocaine users can have completely clean arteries. This is one example that comes to mind. And then suddenly the artery from cocaine, a line of cocaine, can constrict the artery, fill it up with blood clot, and you have a heart attack or stroke. That can happen. There's a condition in women, since you're both women, uh, that is becoming more frequent. It's called SCAD, S-C-A-D. It's been featured in the New York Times and other uh, articles. Spontaneous coronary artery dissection. Uh, maybe a little more concentrated around pregnancy, maybe related to hormone fluctuations weakening the artery. But it's not a atherosclerosis situation, but the artery can actually rip, tear, and there can be a stroke or heart attack. And we, we are seeing that with more frequency. It's rather distressing that uh, we're seeing these younger, healthy women too. So that's one unusual but growing spectrum of the overall kind of responsibility a heart specialist might deal with. That's also not known to be a diet-related problem. We're still talking the big elephant in the room are diet-related heart conditions that we have great amount of control over. So in speaking of things that we have control over, what are the things? So you say diet is a main cause of heart disease. Uh, what are the other things that are the main causes of heart disease that are um, not, uh, well, gosh, that are con in our control to change? Yeah. Yeah. So it wasn't so clear cut. You know, there was a rise in heart attacks after World War II. And that's when our government started pumping money into answering the question. When President Eisenhower had a big heart attack in 1955, our government really started pumping money. Some of you may have heard of something called the Framingham study outside of Massachusetts, which launched in 1948 with government money. And that's where we learned, let's take a healthy population like a community outside of Boston. Let's uh, follow them over over time, let's figure out who's had a heart attack over time, who's had a stroke, who's died suddenly, who's had an aneurysm. And we were able to parse out. That's where we got the smoking data. That's where we got diabetes type 2 and type 1 raises the risk. That's where we learned high blood pressure was a risk, high cholesterol. Then we learned LDL cholesterol. And then we learned even beyond that from studies of that kind. So we talk about the big five. Do you smoke? Do you have high blood pressure? Do you have high cholesterol? Do you have high blood sugar? And does mom, dad, brother, sister have a heart attack, stroke, bypass, dropped at, at a young age where there might be a genetic influence that you inherited? Those are the big five. There's at least 10 to 15 other. Uh, and nowadays we talk about bad sleep. We talk about sedentary lifestyles. We talk about chronic stress. Maybe we're talking about Wi-Fi and EMF. That's a little in the woo. Um, we're talking about, you know, um, endocrine disruptors in your makeup, in your perfume, in your cans and plastic bottles and such. These, these are not in the woo. Those are mm -hmm. seriously disrupting hormone patterns and uh, influencing our health. So uh, it's a complex formula, but the ones we can control. Uh, my, my friend at Yale, Dr. David Katz, talks about forks, fingers, feet. Forks, what do you eat? That's a huge influence on your risk of disease, heart, and others. Fingers, do you smoke? And feet, are you moving? Are you exercising? Are you walking? Are you standing? That, uh, along with social connections and love and community, can be you know things we have control over. We may not have control over the quality of the air that we're breathing uh, in New York City or New Delhi on any given day, but that also matters. Something you just said I think is important um, that in the genetic category, if you have somebody in your family that died of, um, of, let's say, heart disease or stroke at a young age, then you might look at the genetics because I I hear all the time. It's we all hear it all the time. Oh, I'm doomed. It's in in my genetics. It's like maybe it's not. Maybe your ancestors, your uncle, your grandfather had a bad diet. Yeah, and because diet is handed down through families, just exactly. like DNA is, right? Uh, 
Absolutely. And you, we and number one, there is a maybe a bit of an inappropriate statement. Heart disease runs in my family because nobody runs in my family. You know, making the point that lifestyle choices <laughs> may be common among similar family members as well as food choices may be. But we have the ability through advanced lab testing, saliva testing. I do these on my patients routinely. I can tell you if your father or mother's early heart event was something you inherited and something we can specifically focus mm. on. So, we've, you know, you just got to get past the routine physical exam that people are having. And that's kind of the specialty preventive clinic that I uh, run and embark on. This is the Khan Longevity Center in Michigan. We're trying to keep you alive and healthy for a long time because mm-hmm. it's, nice. it's a great time to be alive. Medicine is very exciting right now. I want to go back a little bit. Um, you you went to Med School University of Michigan, is that right? Go blue, go blue. <laughs> and, uh, you graduated first in your class. Uh, that's true. Yeah. There are a lot of great friends of mine, but I guess I spent five more minutes memorizing a biochemical pathway, apparently. <laughs> or maybe maybe you got some some you got something because you were way ahead of your time. Just three three weeks or so into your career as a cardiologist, you began to see that lifestyle was really something you needed to be talking to your patients about. Yeah, I was just a sponge. I'm not the creator of the data, but uh, it's true. I began my medical practice July 1, 1990, so we're just about at 30 years. Uh, and I was a stent guy. I was a balloon guy. I was your heart attack guy. I was up at 3 in the morning threading things in people's arteries and loving every second of it. That's how we cleaned out arteries. That's how men cleaned out arteries. There were a few female cardiologists at that time, but not very many doing it. But then three weeks after I started, Dr. Dean Ornish of San Francisco, an internationally known preventive medicine physician, published a paper. And in those days, there wasn't the internet. The journal came to my house and I read it and I said, holy baloney, this guy's making plaque go away through yoga and meditation and cessation of smoking and a plant diet. I was eating a plant diet already at that time. Didn't call it vegan, didn't call it whole food. There, you know, it was early in the game, but I was doing it. And I said, this is amazing. I had no idea my personal choice uh, based on the last 10 years uh, in the family had this medical impact. Nobody really know. So you're right. I started teaching patients. You might need a balloon or a stent. You might have had a heart attack. But the most important thing I can do for you is give you the tools to prevent the next episode by adopting a healthier and better diet based in science. It's profoundly effective science. So you had been a vegetarian or a vegan uh, for 10 years before? Yeah. I actually walked into the University of Michigan in 1977, 43 years ago, and reacted to the dormitory food, the exact antithesis of the incredible cooking my mother had at home. And I started eating out of the salad bar the first week, and I never went away from that. I felt good. My girlfriend felt good. She's been my wife for almost 40 years. Aww. So I was... You know, over the course of 13 years, I went from vegetarian to full-on vegan uh, and was rocking and rolling with broccoli sprouts and kale and bok choy by the time I read this article. It was, frankly, I did my cardiology training. I'm from Michigan, but I did it in Dallas and Kansas City, which are two of the biggest meat and barbecue cities in America. (laughs) A little challenging in the 1980s. There was nothing called Whole Foods there. There was boiled okra. I ate more boiled okra than uh, any human should, but... uh, (laughs) I made it through. I made it through. <laughs> Were you doing it because you realized, oh, I, f- I feel good on this? Or did yeah, you then? It was. It was that. Oh. And then in about 1985, a book was published by John Robbins called A Diet for New America. And some angel handed me the book and said, you're going on vacation. Take this and read it. I ha- actually don't know who that was. And it really was profound because I didn't understand that there was an environmental issue. I didn't understand there was animal rights and animal abuse. I mean, I grew up as a typical person. I was focused on medicine. And, and the book presented as much medicine of plant-based eating. I did not know the name Nathan Pritikin and things like that. So it was very transformative to understand this was actually a, a big deal and could be very good for me and my family, but proved to be very good for my patients. Mm -hmm. Very grateful. Are you seeing uh, the young generation coming through medical school now, um, they don't seem to be talking about Ornish's research like you are and like we are. And do you think that it's just, there's so much more research and so it's, they're inundated or they're, it's not coming to their front step anymore and they have to sift through a thousand emails. This research came out this reach. Why don't 
the young why doesn't the young generation know more about well, Ornish's research from 30 yeah, years ago? Yeah, you know, there's there's I agree with you. There's good and bad about uh, that fact that it's actually now um, 1990 to 2020 in terms of are these students hearing that in fact Ornish's data never made a big impact in cardiology overall it could have been you know the singular wow moment of 1990 and hospitals could have embraced programs to teach lifestyle medicine in conjunction with all the technology for a lot of reasons, technology is fun, technology is financially uh, rewarding. Um, some could say that his studies at that time didn't have very many patients. It did not create a wow moment for most people. It took over a decade before insurance companies started paying for patients to have therapy like a Pritikin program and an Ornish program. In fact, it took to 2010, so literally took 20 years from the first publication. And I would say right now, if you did a poll, I'm very sad to say this, if you did a poll of cardiologists, many would not know who Dean Ornish and his research was, Caldwell Esselstyn and his research, Neil Barnard and his research on type 2 diabetes. Um, it's not where the money is. It's not where the pharmaceutical representatives are. It's not where the grand round speakers are. Um, I'm very hopeful, though, that the students are getting it indirectly. The students, because I do, I'm a professor at Wayne State in Detroit, and I lecture to them. The students know what the Game Changers movie is. The students have heard of Forks Over Knives. The students at least are aware that there's a lot of athletes and a lot of plant-based energy going on. They know, you know, they're following it. It's everywhere on social media. And, you know, they're willing to be open-minded. So we've had some radically interesting days at Wayne Med School of, like, food days, teaching them how to cook and prepare and understand the medicine. Got a long way to go, but I am actually hopeful. Um, and just to bring it up to, like, right now, just, a couple, just about six weeks ago, a $100 million cardiology research study was announced, the results, in Philadelphia at the American Heart Association. It was 5,000 very sick heart patients, clogged arteries around the world, failed stress tests, having chest pain, very bravely were randomized. Half of you take medication, learn how to eat very healthy, learn how to exercise very healthy. Half of you go right ahead to stents and bypass as the first choice. The study was announced there's no difference in outcome, no difference in deaths, no difference in heart attack rates. It took from 1990 um, 39 years to get a large study, 29 years, I did the math wrong, uh, 29 years, to get a really large study that could convince the medical community that this lifestyle nonsense is as effective as bypass and stents. Now we got to get through to hospital administrators who don't want, you know, half of their cardiology income to be dried up. They don't have programs to teach people what this large study called the ischemia study showed. But it's absolutely validation that this is what we should be offering patients as an alternative um, because it's very effective and frankly, it puts the power back in the patients, which uh, in many instances is really where it should be. And you have to be a doctor willing to go out of business because if this works, you're not gonna have right. any more patients and that's where yep. you're willing and some others are it's, and yeah. It's a sad comment, but it's true and it's gonna take a while to retool the medical system to really provide adequate preventive resources and adequate nutrition resources but uh, anybody listening can go look up the ischemia study dr dean ornish mr nathan pritikin you can school yourself into a better cardiovascular status pretty simply without physician input that's why you have a restaurant because you figure i better diversify before i get uh, go Absolutely. out of business because <laughs> all your patients are going to be getting getting so there healthy is, there is no cow it's such a cash cow i believe me <laughs> It's not a cash cow. <laughs> it's a hard work, uh, too, I'm sure. <laughs> this is, right here is the payroll for the restaurant <laughs> next week. It's always coming from my pocket. <laughs> um, Dr. Khan, can you talk, let's talk about food. Let's talk about why is it that uh, fat, specifically animal fat, contributes to the clogging of the arteries? Because I don't think I quite understand after the digestive process it's not like the butter goes directly to the arteries. Um, yeah, it's a good point, and um, I think we do understand how it happens. So it, it, you know, the way nutrition science often happens first are observations. In your introduction, you shouted out the name of the country, Finland. 
Well, it may not be the highest heart disease rates now, but in 1968, 69, 1970, it was the highest heart disease rates in the Western world. 40-year-old guys, lumberjacks, were dropping dead of heart attacks left and right. It was having an enormous economic impact on the country. True fact. The worst region was actually the region of Finland right next to Russia. It's called oh. East of Finland or North Karelia is the little region. And the country got so concerned, they brought in certain experts from around the world. They had their own internal team. And they came up with a plan and said, we think the problem is based on the previous couple decades of science. The average meal in Finland is butter, it's salami, it's a white bread. And we eat that three times a day. 40% of the calories in Finland were from fat sources, almost all saturated fat. Very different than some of the Mediterranean uh, pockets where there were higher fat diets of olive oil uh, and such. And they designed a program. They literally went to the sausage makers, said, we want you to sneak beans in the sausage as a government project. We're going to bring the saturated fat down. They brought in substitutes. Everybody cringes. They brought in margarine instead of butter. They actually also taught the public that smoking was bad for you. It was a comprehensive program. Five years later, the heart attack rate was 85% lower in that region of Finland. Then they extended it to the whole country and within five more years, the entire country had a heart attack rate 80% lower, as was also cancer rates dropped and diabetes rates dropped. So it's one of the most stunning examples and they've actually followed the health of the Finnish people up and they continue to eat better than they did in the late 60s and they continue to have one of the better um, disease rates throughout Europe. Uh, Northern Europe tends to have a pretty high heart attack rate. There's something about sunshine in the southern parts of Europe that's a little healthier. But Finland is a remarkable case. So with that example and many others out there, scientists got uh, you know, down and dirty in the lab. What is it about saturated fat that damages arteries? And to be very technical, but I think I'm correct, on our liver, everybody hang with me, we have little receptors, little lock and key receptors that are there for LDL cholesterol. And when you eat a diet high in animal saturated fat, there is a reaction that the number of receptors on the liver go down. So if your little lock and keys are less abundant, the LDL cholesterol in your bloodstream won't be taken up into the liver to be reformulated and reconstituted and used for vitamin D and used for um, making hormones and cortisol. So it is that known reaction. A high saturated fat diet affects the receptor density in the liver. It's very technical stuff. The end point is saturated fat raises your blood LDL cholesterol. Because it's is hanging it. out in the blood. It can't, it's not it's being in the metabolized. Blood. So yeah. Here you have an artery and you're smoking a little. You've damaged your artery, but now you've got lots more LDL cholesterol. That combination of smoking and high saturated fat animal diets, it's a double whammy. Maybe your blood sugar's up because you're sedentary or you, uh, you, know, you like to eat high. Also, saturated fat does make us insulin resistant and raise our blood sugar. So you've got excess glucose uh, damaging the lining of your arteries. Now you've got a lot more LDL cholesterol that can join and create damage. That kind of general combination of factors. There are people that eat a high saturated fat diet. There are people with a high LDL cholesterol that don't clog their arteries. We've all heard the 103-year-old woman who smokes and eats bacon and doesn't have a heart attack. But it's called risk factors. You know, a high saturated diet is a risk factor for clogging your arteries. It's also a risk factor for uh, advanced dementia, developing diabetes. It's not exclusive to artery disease. So little sciency. And then we look at examples like Finland and we look at um, organized studies where we lower the Ornish study would be one. We dramatically lower the intake of saturated fat in the diet by eliminating cheeses, full fat dairies, meats, and we see that we can lower cholesterol dramatically without medication, and we can actually cause arteries to begin to reverse the plaque that they have. So uh, it's pretty solid science that, you know, up to date, the largest, most expensive cardiology study in the United States called the ischemia trial still recommended a low saturated fat diet. This is not anything that is now passe or we rethought it. Well, we've rethought a bit. Do all diets need to be low fat? 
can they be low in saturated fat, but can they enjoy olives and avocados and nuts and seeds? And I don't eat animal products, but maybe some lean, you know, venison and game that's naturally low in saturated fat. It probably is true that those are healthier diets than what the average American is eating. Okay. Can you explain uh, the inflammation that's caused are as a, a product of the C-reactive protein. I, that's something that's very interesting to athletes as well, right? That the inflammatory effects of animal-based foods, and that's a, what a lot of people are talking about coming out of the game changers and kind of if they're willing to to dive deeper and, and move towards a plant-based diet, understanding how these foods are inflaming their system, which we don't want because we're inflaming it enough with the, um, you know, really hard training. Yeah, and we can go back, and again, not too sciencey. You can go back 150 years, and a scientist, Rudolf Virchow, who looked at arteries on autopsy and pathology, saw white blood cells, and created the idea that some of the accumulation that clogs arteries is inflammation. It's the immune system and white cells and a response uh, to the arteries. Mm -hmm. We we had that data, but until we developed ways to test for inflammation in blood vessels, and it's actually blood work. You mentioned one of them, high sensitivity C-reactive protein, a test that Harvard Med School owns a patent on. It's not expensive. Everybody should ask their doctor, can I please have my high sensitivity C-reactive protein done in my routine blood work? Because we know if you have a high LDL cholesterol, and a high, high sensitivity C-reactive protein, you're again at a double whammy, your arteries are irritated, plus you have too much of that cholesterol around. There is pretty good data, I give credit, I don't know if it's really due to Andrew Weil from University of Arizona, talking about anti-inflammatory diets and pro-inflammatory diets. And we know in general, diets that are rich in brightly colored fruits and vegetables, legumes, peas, beans, lentils, and such, tend to lower the high sensitivity C-reactive protein in our anti-inflammatory. And we do know that certainly processed foods, garbage foods that are high in fat, salt, and sugars, chemicals that you're going to find in grocery stores and vending machines and fast food restaurants, but possibly even animal foods in general, tend to raise the high sensitivity C-reactive protein, make us insulin resistant, raise our cholesterol. So for example, just to conclude, in um, early 2019, New York University published a study of 100 heart patients. Half of them did the American Heart Association diet, which is far better than the average American diet. Half of them did a plant-based diet designed to be very anti-inflammatory, brightly colored purples and reds and yellows and greens of whole food. The C-reactive protein fell much more during the 12 or 16 week study on the plant diet than even the reasonably balanced American Heart Association diet. So yeah, we can lower our inflammation through our food choices. We can lower it through moderate exercise. You're absolutely right. Massive exercise can raise inflammation and then a plant diet might allow recovery quicker after massive exercise. Can you explain what what the current uh, knowledge is on fish oil because a lot of people seem to be taking being told by their doctors to add fish oil yet Eskimos have very high incidence of clogged arteries right well, and is fish oil good for arteries or is it bad well it's interesting what you just said because the general public conception and very often quoted and by speakers is look at the intake of fats and fish oils that the um, Inuits, the Eskimos had, and they had no known heart disease. In fact, years ago, there was a study that said they did have abnormal arteries. They didn't live very long, 30s, 40s, so they didn't have uh, a long lifespan to develop all the manifestations. But just in the news in the last couple of weeks were some autopsies of Inuit Eskimos showing much more advanced coronary disease and then previously appreciated. So I think it's a myth that um, that we necessarily can bombard our body with unlimited amounts of fish and marine oils and not have any harm. It's always protective. But the pendulum has swung back and forth uh, since we started talking about um, essential fatty acids like EPA, DHA 30 to 40 years ago. Um, we had 15 years of very large studies from Japan, United States and others. Looked like all benefit. 
adding 1,000 milligrams a day, 2,000 milligrams a day of EPA, DHA, fish oil, whether it be a brain disease, a heart disease, a rheumatologic disease was beneficial, beneficial. In the last five, six, seven years, we've seen a number of studies that don't show the benefit and very few studies that have suggested maybe there's even harm to supplementing. Most recently, the pendulum is back to benefit and that, um, you know, the key is just to step back. Omega-3 fatty acids, which are important in cholesterol control, cell membrane, brain health, inflammation. We don't make any. Humans have no ability to make EPA or DHA. So either you're eating it by ground flax and chia and hemp and walnuts and leafy greens and chlorella, um, salmon and sardines, but most fish are not very rich in omega-3 precursors. Uh, it's not precursors, EPA, DHA. The deep water, cold water fish are or we're deficient. So I measure blood levels in my patients. There's a pretty widely available test to measure your blood level of EPA, DHA, DPA, omega-3 fatty acids. People are deficient all over the place. Because you know how many people are being told by their doctor or their mother, be sure to get your two tablespoons of ground flaxseed every day. You know, frankly, it's not a very <laughs> common recommendation. And if you don't do the blood test, which isn't in a routine panel that most primary care docs are offering, you won't know. I am overall a fan of trying to supplement like crazy through food. A couple of tablespoons of ground flaxseed every day is just the easiest approach. Walnuts are the only nut really rich in omega-3. But I am not opposed to if a blood test shows a very low level using a supplement. There are vegan, algae-based omega-3 brands everywhere now. Used to be rare. They're getting pretty potent. And of course, there's fish oil supplements and you got to really pick high quality fish oil because mercury contamination and other concerns. I recommend the algae because that's what the fish eat and so why not just go to the source, right? Um, so I agree with you and you know you really don't, the algae that's being used in the um, supplements for omega-3 are grown in tanks. We don't have to really worry about contamination with mercury and PCBs and DDT. It seems to be a much cleaner way to supplement uh, your EPA and your DHA. Mm -hmm. and can, I want to speak for a minute about the confusion that is rampant in what should we be eating, right? And especially at this time of year, uh, people are, are going on diets or, or some fad diets, um, <coughs> keto. Um, but what the differences are, uh, you know, keto, paleo, Mediterranean, vegan, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in terms of, uh, I'd like to talk about carbohydrates because there is amongst many of them still, I think, even vegan. Uh, just an intense, incredible carbohydrate fear. And I heard this when I went to speak this summer at the USDA, right? There were 70 speakers. We all had three minutes, lots of dietitians, lots of doctors, and they are still speaking about we've got to eat a lower carbohydrate diet. But we know that there is a difference between dates and donuts, Pop-Tarts and potatoes, right? Uh, lollipops and lingonberries, big, big, big difference. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much. Uh, so that's what I want to unravel, right? The difference between the simple over-processed carbohydrates, why they're easily addictive and why they are nutrient void, right. and complex carbohydrates that that's, you, you know, you, you've got me on the potato kicker. I guess that was Chef AJ. But I'm just roasting potatoes and just that's, it's constantly breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I'm just eating mouthfuls of potatoes and I feel amazing. And it's carbohydrates. Right. Yeah. Right. So again, um, you're absolutely spot on and the language is usually very loose, very uh, inaccurate and, and confusing and damaging. Um, are there examples, are the majority of examples of people that have excellent longevity around the world eating a high carbohydrate based diet, complex carbohydrates, peas, beans, potatoes, rice, corn, um, absolutely, whether we're talking Asian or Incan or Mayan, absolutely. They're not eating cookies, cakes, candies. Uh, you know, it's not the refined, processed flours and sugars and such. I always say the whiter the bread, the sooner you're dead. I mean, we know <laughs> there are nutrient depleted foods that might be characterized by some as a carbohydrate, but the word should be modified. Refined carbohydrates versus whole or complex carbohydrates. It makes for a mouthful to try and describe as you talk to your friends and your family and all the rest. You know, 
I'm eating a high complex carbohydrate diet like the Okinawans. I'm eating a high complex carbohydrate diet like Loma Linda Seventh day Adventist. Those would be intelligent statements that are backed by observational data that those are extremely healthy diets, including potatoes and peas and beans and corns and all the rest. Um, you know, they have fiber, they have nutrients, they have minerals, they're filling, they are low in calories per you know, serving size, uh, nutrient density. Uh, you can lose weight on them. You can prevent and reverse diabetes on them. You know, these complex carbohydrate foods do not cause diabetes. They, in fact, can be used as a way to treat and reverse type 2 diabetes, of course. But the language is just sloppy. Um, uh, there also is a need to separate a bit the language animal protein, plant protein. We all know it's an important um, macronutrient in the diet, but peas, beans, lettuce, greens can all provide it. Yeah, we just lump. You know, I love going to uh, Chipotle or one of the restaurants. I got a whole bowl full of beans, and the question is, what kind of protein you want in there? I know. Look, look, <laughs> it's there. It's there. Just give me my salsa. I'm out of here. And then the last might be uh, animal fats, plant fats, because there is a difference between an avocado and um, a, you know, a side of beef or a, a lard uh, and bacon. But to answer your... And the difference uh, you know, is, is because of the uh, LDL, the, 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 the kind of fat it is, right? Right. That's in it, the and, concentration of saturated fat, sorry. That's true. Um, but, you know, there is a crisis of weight gain and obesity and type 2 diabetes and sleep apnea, you know, people are frustrated and they view often a plant-based diet as too difficult or too restrictive. So let's just, you know, why not have our meats, our cheeses, our bacon and do an Atkins style diet, which is now called a keto diet. Um, you know, paleo is based on a romantic theory. We can eat like the cavemen that preceded us. I don't mind paleo and keto in one sense. They sh shun processed foods. They shun added sugars. They shun nobody's eating at McDonald's if they're authentically doing a clean paleo diet. The problem is they might go through McDonald's and have the bun, have the beef, throw the bun away. I mean, that's no advantage to your health. But um, you talk about the bulk of the medical science. Here's whole food plant diets. Here's uh, paleo diets, very little data. Here's ketogenic diets in terms of certainly cardiovascular health. It's, you know, it's not even close to the degree of confidence you can have. If you're struggling with your weight, struggling with your blood pressure, struggling with inflammation, and your choice is let's do eight or 12 weeks of a whole food plant-based forks over knives, Dr. McDougall, there's many, many examples of this kind of diet where I'm going to go meet keto or meet paleo, you're in much safer territory and probably more effective territory to just jump on in and join Veganuary and Februaryannuary and just keep it going. <laughs> uh, the science is overwhelmingly strong and it's pretty clear some people respond to the low carb animal rich keto diet and their cholesterol literally can jump 250 to 700. I have patients, I've reported uh, patients like that. Uh, that doesn't happen with a plant diet. You add you know, chickpeas and lentils and cucumbers and sweet potatoes, your cholesterol is not going up to 700. I can virtually guarantee you that. It's probably going to drop 40, 50 points. You've talked about how meat is not good for us because it's inflammatory. Also, you mentioned that it also raises our insulin, which a lot of people don't understand when they're uh, diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. They they shun the potatoes and start eating meat, which is the opposite of what I think you would recommend. Correct. Uh, correct, correct, correct. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think there's a spectrum of diets for most people that are healthier than what the average American is eating. And they're always going to be plant forward, plant strong, a term out there called flexitarian. I eat a lot of plants, but I might have a piece of salmon. I might have a small grilled chicken. I might have, you know, a small uh, sirloin. That's actually why uh, there is some data for the paleogenic diet, paleolithic diet, I apologize, ketogenic diet, paleolithic <laughs> diet. I got that confused for a minute. You know, if you truly follow the book that Lauren Cordain wrote in the 1990s and 2000s, The Paleo Diet, we're talking about trying to find wild venison and wild bison. I don't like the idea of any of that. They're cute little animals and I don't want you whacking over the head to fill your plate. But if you know, if you if you actually eat a lot of leafy greens and berries and nuts and seeds and a little naturally lower fat wild meats, 
you created a diet that's much healthier and in a few small duration studies can help weight inflammation and diabetes. Um, you know, the reality is the way people do the paleo diet and some people have added some dairy back to the paleo diet. Some people have added some legumes back. It's a whole hodgepodge now and it seems to be losing a little steam. Um, you know, most people are not doing it. They're, you know, factory farm meats rich in pesticides and antibiotics and steroids and poor quality and they're eating more of these poor quality meats that are also poor quality to the environment and they're certainly poor quality to the animals um you know they're not doing this in this romantic way that uh the books originally described uh, there are people that are eating meat two and three meals a day the the odd but growing carnivore diet and they're just packing in at the local grocery store meats that are, you know, they're not the grass-fed organic, and I'm not sure there's really any advantage, but it sounds cool when people say, but my diet is all grass-fed. I mean, they're just buying mm -hmm. so much meat, they're buying at the local grocery store, and, you know, just the antibiotic burden that they're introducing to their body alone, uh, the actual estrogen burden they're adding from actual animals that have actual estrogen. Plant estrogens are not an issue. Your your beef has estrogen, your milk has estrogen, you're drinking, that's a health concern. And I learned this from a grass-fed farmer I was at his farm with his 11 cows. They head to a feedlot for a full six months. They're grass fed oh, they're for grass their, for their, you know, his first s s four months, really, because they was killed about nine, nine months or 10 months or 12, right, you know, right in there. And that the last six months of his life, he heads to a feedlot. So people think that grass fed is like they are grass fed. No, they're grass fed for, you know, and this was an organic grass fed farm. Like I said, very tiny, just 11 cows. And uh, so that's yeah. little tidbits for people to really know what's happening. Um, can I just do one more carbohydrate thing before of <laughs> I, course. I I wanted I to, I wanted to see um, <laughs> Dr. Khan, if you would take me on a journey and let's, let's do weight loss. I'm not trying to lose weight, but it's the new year. And some people are yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, of what, happens from let's say from a blood sugar or whatever you think is important um when i eat a a a pop tart for breakfast versus when i eat a sweet potato for breakfast even if it's the same amount of calories absolutely yeah let's 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 call it even on the on the amount of calories okay or can we let me answer the question first bacon and eggs versus a sweet potato you might have to eat two sweet potatoes because we want to keep the calories okay. you know, pretty <laughs> similar you know there's far fewer calories per 100 gram of sweet potato than there's going to be in 100 grams of bacon. It's right. much more much more calorie dense, which isn't an advantage. That's why the sweet potato will fill you up and is an advantage. So the current theory of type 2 diabetes, I believe most people uh, buy into that are really uh, in the science world is, and this was just uh, in a profoundly interesting paper in the last couple of weeks again. But we become insulin resistant when we eat foods that are higher in saturated fat, animal saturated fat. Why? Actually, we get little droplets of fat globules, fat lipid globules and droplets in our liver cells and our muscle cells. The liver cells may be more. When our blood is rich in creamy post bacon and egg meal, creamy, we take up those cholesterol little particles, those uh, triglyceride little particles into our cells and our liver. Um, next time we eat the Pop-Tart um, and our pancreas says, ooh, refined carbohydrate, sugar, I'm dumping insulin into the bloodstream. Of course, it's also going to dump insulin after the bacon and eggs. Um, the insulin circulates. It goes to a liver cell. It's supposed to unlock insulin receptor to allow the cell to take that sugar up from the pop tart or the sugar up from the maple glazed bacon and it, it those little droplets cause insulin resistance in the liver cells if you eat the sweet potato you're not turning your blood into a creamy mess that looks like mayonnaise and it literally does if you eat bacon and eggs and you take a blood sample and you spin it the red cells go down and the plasma's on top it can be creamy creamy looking like mayonnaise after a fatty meal like bacon and eggs or a sausage egg mcmuffin it won't look like that after a beautiful two cup two sweet potatoes and all be clean and clear and look like beautiful clear motor oil so 
you know, you're creating insulin resistance with those high fat meals um, like bacon and eggs. So the next time you have a pop tart, you're insulin resistant. Your blood sugar goes up, stays up where normally insulin would have acted and brought your blood sugar down. And you can test that with a two hour glucose tolerance test if you really want to know how your how the sugar and insulin is reacting. Whether the pop tart causes diabetes is controversial. Assuming, I don't know the fat content of a pop tart, but assuming it's mainly refined flour and added sugar from the topping and the filling and all the rest. If you go, uh, this was a very controversial statement in the movie What the Health in 2017, where Dr. Neil Bernard said, sugar does not cause type 2 diabetes. And he got attacked like he was an ignorant man, even though he's widely published in the university professor. I was interested in it because I didn't understand all the data. Went to the American Diabetes Association, little box at the top, Interesting facts of diabetes. Sugar does not cause type 2 diabetes. It was right there. Went to the wow. Joslin went to the Joslin Diabetes Center website. I mean, these are intelligent websites. Little box. Sugar does not cause type 2 diabetes. Insulin resistance in liver cells and muscle cells called to type 2 diabetes. And the high fat content, much more likely to come from animal sources, seems to trigger that. And you can easily reverse it. That's why one week at a, you know, kind of a John McDougal a retreat, a Rip Esselstyn retreat, a Pritikin Center retreat, changing your diet to whole food, plant-based, naturally low in fat. All of a sudden, your blood sugar drops so much, they have to take you off type 2 diabetic medications to avoid you getting hypoglycemic because it can really reverse the insulin resistance in your liver and muscle that fast. Now, what about weight loss, though? You've, you've talked on your podcast and you have some blogs about it. Is There's a lot of people who come to you and say, I'm eating a plant-based diet and it's whole foods, but I'm not losing weight. What do you yeah. tell them? Yeah, it's a real problem. I think we don't talk about it enough. Um, we have large gatherings and lectures. There's one tomorrow night in Detroit and hundreds of people, and they're not all thin, even though it's a plant-based uh, community gathering. I think there's, you know, there are medical issues that need to be looked at. Is your thyroid status good? Do you have sleep apnea? Do you need what we call a home sleep apnea study? You can run into a problem snoring, not breathing, stress all night long. You're not going to lose weight until that's identified and corrected. Uh, and the very weight gain is what may contribute to sleep apnea problems. Um, are you being authentic with your diet? And I'm not accusing anybody, but we know in general uh, patient reported habits like how much you smoke, how much you drink, and how much you eat. When you really get down to it, uh, maybe use you know certain chronometer apps or other ways to take pictures and measure what you're eating may reveal that there's ways to tweak. Um, we don't need six meals a day. We don't need to eat 15 hours a day. We're learning more and more that two or three meals a day without grazing, maybe within a 10 to 12 hour window, uh, may allow more recovery and uh, rejuvenation, regeneration of cells overnight. So, uh, you know, you got to look, late night eating is, in general, we all know it, a bad habit. I'm very big on like shutting the mouth around 7 p.m., 7.30 p.m. as a kind of absolute rule. Um, there might be vitamin deficiencies, vitamin D, omega-3. I'm not sure those actually contribute to uh, weight gain. Um, you know, very sedentary lifestyles, although we believe more weight loss is from dietary choices than it is from upping your fitness routine. You can't out-exercise a bad diet as a common statement. Um, so we go through the list. Okay, that's very helpful. I think that'll help people uh, at least look at some of those sleep and um portion c control and just all of that yeah all that. yeah so and i'll just say you mentioned chef aj you know that's where i might educate somebody about a stricter more restrictive mm. no salt oil sugar diet mm -hmm. if they really hit a roadblock and uh you know that's a diet not everybody's going to grab onto but if they're really looking for a solution a plant diet without any added salt oil or sugar as common food uh, craving kind of triggers, food addiction kind of triggers may be very useful. Yeah, we had Dr. Susan Peterson on our show too, Brightline Eating, and I've heard you love, mention Brightline Eating. I love Brightline. I love Brightline, and I like that they have a plant-based option in their program. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I have one last question. You, you have the Khan Longevity Center. You help people change their lifestyle. The hardest thing, diet, exercise, these are really hard things to change. What is your philosophy on helping people to change? What are the things that you recommend yeah. to people on how to change? 
Well, so step one in what I do in general, I call it kind of high tech, high touch, high fiber. I, it's very high tech. I mean, I know a complete panel of some of their genetics, their inflammation, their advanced lipids and other factors. Um, and I explain it to them in a way they understand. I usually will know something about their arteries by a carotid ultrasound or something called a heart calcium CT scan. So I know at the beginning, am I dealing with somebody with silent but serious heart disease or with risk factors, but pretty innocent arteries at that point. So that's the high tech part. And it keeps getting more and more advanced. Um, we're, we're really at a really interesting time where we can measure physiology on patients. I have a watch right now I'm wearing from China that has 50 million EKGs built in. And anytime I want to run my EKG and get a full printout, and that's just the beginning. You know, there's wow. some, some biometrics of glucose and pressure. And um, I actually have an app on my phone from Israel that's not out yet. Just every time you look at your phone and text somebody, it's measuring your stress level, your heart rate, your oxygen level, and giving you feedback if you seem to be out of whack. Very cool stuff. High touch. I mean, I'm spending a lot of time. I have a clinic where I can sit down for an hour with patients. And um, but I will tell you, I don't have a dietitian or a big staff. I use the documentary Forks Over Knives. I literally make everybody, you know, encourage them to watch it or take a copy home. I encourage them to read. I I read. I write short books. And I usually recommend short books. If somebody has the energy to get through How Not to Die by Michael Greger or his new book called How Not to Diet, which is fantastic at 700 pages. Okay. But for most people, I'm happy if they read 90 pages um, and all. And uh, I will select a book for them. I will tell you the last magic. We have in Detroit an organization, several organizations. We have community-based healthy eating organizations. I helped founded one of them. A guy called me six years ago this month and said, I have heart disease, I'm struggling to deal with it through diet, and I know nobody doing this. Can your practice provide me five, 10 other people and we have a little you know, group support? That little group is 7,000 members now. There was so much interest. It's called Plant-Based Nutrition Support Group on the web, plant-based. Everybody should do that in their community. Because I can tell my patient I saw today, do you know tomorrow night, Dr. Michael Greger is lecturing to hundreds of people at a local high school because we can bring in speakers. You can meet other people. I'll introduce you to people that have reversed diabetes, lost 70 pounds, don't have heart symptoms anymore, avoided bypass. You know, we have this amazing collection of people and in it is so powerful. Community is such a powerful force to give me people belief and, you know, people to walk with uh, on this journey. So it takes a little effort to find that, you know, special group, but it's very worth trying to start one up. And, you know, online works, digital communities work, but uh, real life communities uh, like plant-based nutrition support group is. And, and we're expanding this all over the United States not as an economic vehicle. We can't figure out how to make a dollar out of it as a as really a passion project. So people will be able to find in person people through the site who want to want to eat more yeah. healthily. Tomorrow it, night, right? When I introduce Dr. Michael Greger, if I remember, I'm going to ask everybody: If you're in the audience and you lost 100 pounds in the last four years, stand up. It'll be a dozen people, a dozen people. I mean, and they weren't doing this by bariatric surgery. That If you lost 75, if you lost 50, if you lost 20, weight loss isn't the only measure, but for a lot of people, it's what their goal is. And for a lot of people, it's what they need. You know, who's out there that's avoided bypass, you know, as on less drugs for diabetes? You know, in five minutes, we built belief beyond anything that's capable otherwise. Wow. Well, Dotsie and I wish we could be there tomorrow night. I but know. thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Is it going to be recorded you. for people to listen to? Well, if you know Dr. Michael Greger, one once he gives a talk and he's in the groove, you're going to find it on YouTube in okay. a lot of places. Yeah. So I, I think if you go to that website, it's actually pbnsg.org. You okay. don't pay to go to that. I think we do post recorded talks. So, yes, I think it'll be there within a week or two. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Great. there we have it. Thank you so much, Dr. Joel Kahn. This has been really packed. Appreciate it. So good. I enjoyed it thoroughly. Thank you. All right. We know you're busy, so we really appreciate it. And Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Healthy New Year. Yes. <laughs> Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. So thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging out together. We have so much more to share with you. And if you need more information on actually making the switch for good, 
please visit us at switchforgood.org for loads of info. And you can subscribe to our mailing list where you will receive all sorts of super cool gifts, discount codes to our very fave dairy-free products, and a lifetime of powerful health tips. So join us on the journey to Switch for Good. This is the future.